Ah, the energy is you from the EEP chair. And that, that's uh, pronounced EEP, but it might be pronounced EEP. Uh, and we're going to find out what that stands for. We, we always ex expand our acronyms here. Uh, that's Representative Nicole Lowen. She's the EEP chair uh, from the state legislature. And Marco Mangelsdorf, my co-host. And this is Think Tech, and it's, uh, you know, it's the Energy 808, the cutting edge, okay? Welcome to the show, you guys. Uh, aloha, thanks for having me. Thank you, Jay. Aloha, happy Monday to both of you. Thank you. Marco, it falls on you to introduce our guest in, in a more robust way than I did, uh, and, and define the acronym EEP. Uh, and, and also, um, um, can you give us the scope of our discussion today? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Jay, for us uh, reconvening as we have been doing over the years. And thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for joining us today. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to connect with you. And uh, yeah, Nicole has been the chair of the State House Environment, uh, excuse me, Energy and Environmental Protection Committee, uh, a.k.a. EAP. For how, how long has it been going on now? It's been uh, I'm gonna say, four years and four vice years. chair Booker. Four years before that, I think. So, you know, Nicole brings uh, a great wealth of uh, insight and knowledge and being in the trenches there. And in my view, one of the uh, legislature's uh, champions of which we are kind of short of these days, in my opinion, shortage uh, of true champions who are fighting the good fight and trying to pursue a energy environment agenda that uh, seems to be, from my perspective, such a hard slog sometimes and uh, hard to see all the much substantive, substantive progress being made. So thank you so much for uh, again being with us, Nicole, and all that you are doing there in your position of EEP chair. Thanks, happy to be here. It's not really EEP at all, is it? Can, can you give us the, the right pronunciation, Nicole? Um, well, the committee is called the Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection, but it is referred to as EAP. So oh, that is what people say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now we got that straightened out. I feel a lot better about my initial pronunciation. Or you, could say, you could say EEP. Okay. <laughs> so, how was the session this year, Nicole? Uh, what, how do you characterize it? You know, it's an election year, and it somehow changes the chemistry. But can you give us a, a look back and how you feel about what happened? Sure. I feel like overall it was a really successful and productive session um, in many regards, but also um, in terms of the bills that we passed out of my committee. Um, and I'll, I'll stick to, I guess, talking about the energy, specifically energy related um, things, although the committee jurisdiction also covers issues like plastic waste and wastewater and, and things like that. Um, we passed uh, a couple of bills that have been um, multi-year efforts, so it was exciting to get those through and clear clear that. Uh, the first one I'll mention is House Bill 2089, and this bill fixed the formula that's used to calculate the renewable portfolio standard so that um, it will kind of close a loophole that allowed um, the accounting to not be fully accurate, so that it was calculated as a percent of sales as opposed to generation in this Fix has been, you know, a bill that's been introduced uh, probably five years in a row, maybe more, that um, finally passed through this year. So that is of increasing importance as we move forward in the state with adopting more renewable energy. The kind of discrepancy between the two numbers becomes greater and greater. Um, we passed House Bill 1801, and this is the uh, uh, state facilities energy efficiency bill that mandates um, for state facilities over 10,000 square feet to implement cost-effective energy efficiency measures. And then um, this bill also directs that for new construction, it be designed in advance to the degree that it's feasible to be energy efficient and water efficient and to um, maximize energy generation as well where that's possible. So, you know, it, it kind of uh, adding that um, language into the law creates a little more incentive to think about the long-term benefits of building these things in upfront, even when they cost a little more upfront, but actually save money over the long term. Um, and then we also passed House Bill 1800. This um, establishes kind of a near-term decarbonization goal. So the state has a 2045 goal for a net zero um, economy or net negative economy. 
but to keep us moving forward and, and keep real action happening, I think we need some kind of goal before 2045. So what we put in law was 50% uh, by 2030 over 2005 levels. And this is in line with the um, Paris Agreement and the Biden administration. And then this bill also funds a planning process to look at how we will accomplish this um, decarbonization effort you know, not only through renewable energy, which is sort of viewed as the easier piece of it, but also things like transportation, land use, um, aviation, which is part of the challenging part of transportation, I would say, um, and also looks at things like energy equity and, and environmental justice. Um, on that note, we passed a couple of resolutions that will um, direct the PUC to lead efforts to establish a light heat program and to integrate energy equity, throughout their work. Um, and uh, not, I don't want to talk for too long. I want to let you guys ask some questions. We also um, passed um, a bill to just update the already existing. It's been existing for a couple of years now, uh, electric vehicle rebate program. So that adds some flexibility to the program so that we're not being redundant with what's being provided for with the newly available federal funding. Um, it made sure the program continues to be funded and um, uh, expands the, you know, the goal has been in those publicly accessible commercial multi-unit dwellings, getting chargers in those areas. And this kind of expands the ability for Hawaii Energy and the PUC to look at the market and say, what is the need and be able to design the program around what they see as are the needs, the needs are instead of the um, statute being so prescriptive. Uh, and then we also reinstated a biofuels tax credit that had expired, as well as um, passed a couple bills, a couple Senate bills um, that look at renewable hydrogen and how we can continue that conversation and furthering those efforts. So one for study and a second one for rebate program that's somewhat similar to um, similar in structure to our electric vehicle charging system rebate. Um, yeah, there's a number of there's bills that didn't pass and things I think we'll come back to and um the next session but i'll pause there in case there's some questions that you guys have okay let me only say that uh you know you know marco is, is very complimentary to our guests and especially to you nicole but i would like to say that you're awesome that's uh -oh. what i would like to say may i say that marco may i say that i'm saying that that's what i'm saying okay um nicole you know um some people think in the world today that the most important Story is the most existential threat. And climate change is the most existential threat. If you walked around Manoa campus and visited the, um, you know, the journalism program school up there, they would all tell you that the most important story for all of us is the most existential threat, and that's climate change. So you're a very important person as the chair of the EAP committee uh, in Hawaii State Legislature. We have a reputation for being ahead of the game on this. We have our you know, target dates and all that. Um, and um, we understand at least to some extent you know, what it means to contribute to the global effort. Um, but query this, uh, are we moving fast enough? Um, you know, uh, these bunch of bills you've talked about, these bunch of achievements here in 2022, are they as fast as you would like? Um, are we, are we um, playing our proper role in the global effort? Uh, thanks. It's a good question. Um, I think, no, we're never moving fast enough because the threat of climate is so imminent and it's sort of like we're already have passed these milestones by which had, had the humanity been capable of reducing emissions, we could have, you know, kept global warming below a certain amount and that it's, it's just so challenging. I mean, but, you know, on the other hand, I think that we are moving um, faster than a lot of other states. We're kind of, you know, operating. I think I really am one of those people that tries to push the boundaries. A lot of people say, oh, it's impossible. And, you know, I think the, the thing that we have to remember is that the threat of climate change is imminent and getting to decarbonization is an incredible challenge, but it's one that we are, have no choice but to try to meet. Um, but there are real world challenges. So there's real world challenges like uh, in how quickly things can move just for one thing and how quickly you can build an energy project or shift an entire economy. These are like, um, these are like fast moving trains with a lot of momentum that don't change course easily. And so uh, I think Hawaii really has been 
being an example and leading the charge in terms of action at the state level. And at the same time, no, uh, it doesn't seem like like anything could ever be fast enough or possible to you know stem the flow of greenhouse gas emissions immediately. I mean, that would be in terms of mitigating climate change, you know, the, the best possible scenario. So what would obviously not possible. Well, aside from, you know, the real world politic of it, um, if I made you, I made you queen, I made you queen, and I gave you, you know, authoritarian power over all of this without, you know, any real world political limitations, um, what would you do? I mean, and let's assume, you know, like in Don't Look Up, the movie was such a good movie. Uh, and, we, you know, we were facing a, a threat that to destroy humanity in, you know, in the near or intermediate term somehow and see all, all the things that are happening in climate change right now. Um, if I made you queen, what would you do? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather have a magic wand than a crown, I think. Okay, magic wand. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then, no, then we're getting out. I mean, I think both are equally um, like unrealistic, though. So. I mean, uh, I would, I, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess it's a tough question. I don't, I don't know if it's like useful to even attempt to answer it. I mean, obviously, I would like to see emissions, you know, not just from Hawaii, but globally um, reduce a lot more quickly and, you know, all of this to happen in an equitable kind of way that was in sync with community and kept our economy moving forward. You know, of course, it's complete um, ide idealized view, but uh, like, uh, I guess if there's, if there's things that seem possible, I mean, I do sometimes get frustrated, I think, with um, like, like how, I think there's some special interest in Hawaii that we could that really have an outsized influence and that can slow us down. So if we're thinking about things more in the realm of uh, things that are possible to change in the nearer term to help us get more action, I mean, I think that that it's getting everyone to really take this threat of climate seriously um, and, and you know, move past some of those barriers. Yeah, okay, well, maybe, maybe it'll take some dramatic natural event <clears throat> to make us more serious, who knows? And that may happen while you're the chair. Ooh. Uh, but let me, let me uh, go to one other point I wanted to make or ask you about. And that is uh, in, in the um, EAT committee, you have energy and environment. What, what's the connection? How do you see the connection between the two? Are they the same thing? Are they different things? Which one is in, in, the, in the highest priority? Oh, I mean, I think they're kind of completely intertwined, and especially when you talk about climate change, because the, the impacts of climate change and the way that we, you know, can be more resilient is by protecting our natural resources. So, you know, issues like watershed protection is critical as changing climate sort of threatens, um, you know, watersheds, native species, and changes the, the patterns of rainfall, etc. Like, for one example, um, Plastic waste is something I've worked on a lot this year, and I think there's sort of increase. There was some report that came out with, with coal on the decline. It's like uh, plastics are set to overtake coal as a source of greenhouse gas emissions by um, by 2030. You know, in addition to that, they include all kinds of toxic chemicals that end up in our environment, and um, they they pollute the oceans and you know cause a lot of other kind of damage. Um, you know, same with wastewater, for example, another thing that I've worked on, it's like, um, we have too many cesspools in the state that's really damaging to our reef. Um, reefs are under tremendous threat from climate change and coral bleaching events and, you know, warming ocean temperatures. And so the more that we can address all these other environmental problems that compound each other, the, you know, better chance we have of preserving these resources. A huge number of issues. You know, you talk to scientific issues and social issues, political issues, be whiz. I hope, do you sleep well at night, Nicole? These are not the questions I expected to answer, but um, okay. not every night, but yeah, you know, like okay, everybody right. else. You know, about, about halfway through the show, I always turn into a pumpkin uh, and I invite Marco to ask you questions. Some people say I am a pumpkin through the show, but. Uh, at this point, I feel like it's time to ask Marco to ask you some questions. Marco, you know, this witness is yours. Thank you, Counselor. 
So I have a, I have a preamble before the, uh, the judge and jury before I ask the question. Uh, I received an email from the state energy office about, I'm going to say five or six weeks ago. And it was a pretty nondescript email to the point that I don't even remember exactly what it said. But it got me thinking about, gee, how much progress have we made here in the state of Hawaii in getting off this dangerous, very vulnerable dependence that we've had uh, for decades and decades on imported oil? And I decided to do some digging. And uh, what I found in my digging was uh, uh, rather dismaying and disturbing to me, and I'll, I'll share this with you. So back in 1960, the state was dependent on oil for 99.7% of all its energy needs, you know, pretty darn close to 100%, 99.7. And I scrolled forward to 1993, and lo and behold, 1993, that 99.7 had dropped to about 86%, excuse me, 84%, 84% of the state's energy, total energy consumption based on oil. Oh, progress being made, right? And then I brought us up to date or brought myself up to date in terms of the most recent data I could find, uh, which was uh, 2019. I couldn't find anything for 2020, let alone 2021. But for 2019, the total, the percentage of energy consumption in the state of Hawaii, which includes transportation, power generation, anything in between, 2019, uh, it was 86%. So recall that 1993 was 84%, 2019 is 86%. Now we're 2022, and we're probably pretty darn close to the 85, 86%. So I've... Uh, taken something of a dive over the years in terms of well, what kind of support has the state given renewable energy. You can find evidence of a, a solar tax credit going back to when I graduated high school, guys, in 1976, a long time ago. I attended my first energy conference, so one of my first energy conferences, the Sheraton, December 1980, 42, go down 42 years ago. So with that uh, kind of long monologue, uh, I'll close by saying, making a statement, asking a question. I mean, clearly, whatever we're doing, Nicole and Jay and others, whatever we're doing, uh, while laudatory to some extent, is clearly woefully inadequate, woefully deficient. Uh, and now we're 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 seeing the pain. We collectively are seeing the pain of record high utility prices with the 50 cent or so kilowatt hour cost here on this island, uh, 55, I believe, uh, actually 60 plus percent. 60 plus cents a kilowatt hour for small commercial on Molokai, uh, high prices at the pump. So whatever progress we've made, not to diss the progress or the players uh, who've toiled away and the champions who've toiled away over the decade, uh, but we're clearly, we've got to do something different. And I'm not saying I have the answers in terms of what to do differently, but I guess my question to you, Nicole, is, you know, uh, Aside from from a magic wand or a royal title, I mean, realistically, if not uh, if not getting getting more more beyond realism, I mean, what else can we do in this state to truly make more of a rapid dent on this dangerous ongoing? dependence on fuel, liquid fuel that's coming from great, great distances, which puts us in a very vulnerable position, always has, we still are. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's important to remember that the, the big picture doesn't include just our power generation, right? It's also transportation. And transportation is, you know, a larger and larger percent of all that oil that we import. Um, because, you know, as we transition to renewable energy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge concern. There's a, no, there's, it's, it's, uh, there's a number of things, and these are all kind of in statute. For example, when the Public Utilities Commission is considering whether to approve a project, they have to look at affordability, reliability, um, reliance on imports and greenhouse gas emissions, like all of the above. And so it's, it's kind of about balancing all of those things. Um, 
we have projects in, in the pipeline now that, you know, are, are still just a sliver of, you know, where we need to go to reduce that 86% figure that you cited, um, some of which have been delayed by supply chain issues that we've had. Um, is there a way to make these go faster? I mean, that is, a, that's a good question. I, I, I think it's not without a lot of pushback. I mean, it's, it's projects take time. You know, Hawaii is kind of notoriously takes longer um, than a lot of other states. But, you know, if we try to, I think there's ways that we can streamline and push stuff forward to move quicker, but you can't just snap your fingers and have a new, <laughs> you know, a whole new, uh, renewable power plant built overnight. So I think in terms of power generation, these things do take time. Um, the, well, I, think I think there's two things to consider on that, Nicole. One is, yes, they take time. And, you know, the ThinkTech has examined, um, you know, permitting, for example, um, and obstacles to projects. They're, they're, they're legion uh, in this state, and it takes decades sometimes to get to get permit, not only on energy and environmental, projects, but all projects. Um, and on energy specifically, you know, think of all of the contentions and controversies over the past few years where activists have not, you know, it's, it's interesting. Usually you expect activists will advance clean energy, but in so many of our controversy, the activists are opposing clean energy. Yeah, no, I, I, agree. I agree with you. And it's frustrating, I think, for everybody. And people need to understand, I mean, you can't have both or always get everything you want. And at the same time, I think if you sort of took more drastic measures and just ignored the community pushback, you just create further problems down the road. So there's there's repercussions for doing that also. And so, you, you know, you have you, you as much as we'd like to just, you know, make things go faster and push them through faster and you know, take some of the process out of it. There's, there's, you know, potentially repercussions for doing that too. And that well, yeah, you have, you have two things that aren't working. One, one is that you know culturally the state doesn't move fast, and and it's you know it's a consensus model, if you will. Uh, any any group can stop any project; they work at it. But the other thing is, and you referred to this earlier, it's the it's the constituencies, it's the public, it's public opinion. And, and uh, public um, public um, view of this, and <laughs> it strikes me, and I'm interested in your thoughts. You know, the legislature, the government, is a creature of public opinion, of political expression, of public opinion. And I think we we know, do we not, that the public in this state does not recognize the exigencies of climate change. It does not recognize the exigencies of moving ahead. And so you and everybody in the legislature is you know is captive to that. Politically, and I and I wonder what we can do to change public opinion. So everybody has a magic wand. Yeah, I mean, these are the big, really difficult, multifaceted questions that nobody has the right. There's no you know easy answer to. Um, like to Marco's question, also, and this getting back to more specific things, I think that you know, for example, geothermal is an incredible. Um, opportunity for the state, um, but again, it will take time because there's a lot of community sentiment and pushback that has to be worked through. Um, you know, and people are struggling with, you know, not being able to make ends meet, not being able to pay rent, not being able to find a place to rent when their landlord says they're moved, they're selling the house. So, um, to expect them to, you know, make climate change, climate action like a priority is, is um, it's just, that's unlikely, but I do think that sometimes that that's kind of a line or a trope that gets used, even when certain things that we do, um, you know, certain kind of climate related bills, I think in the long term are are geared towards environmental justice and equity and, and having a better outcome for everyone. And yet it's like we always get pushback from building industry. Oh, this is going to, you know, changing building codes is going to cost too much money. And we have a this. Uh, uh, cost of living crisis in Hawaii, so we can't do that, you know, and we, and those kind of, they kind of successfully can shut things um, down based on, you know, I think facts that are debatable. So that, that is frustrating. And I think, you know, it's also while we have these massive challenges with cost of living at the same time, it's going to become more and more real that we cannot ignore this reality of, um, 
of climate change. And I think, well, who knows where U.S. politics will go nationally that that increasingly the rest of the globe is reacting in other ways, too. And there will be pressures from that as well. And as we know, as of uh, what, 10 or so days ago, uh, Leo Sunshin has taken over for Jay Griffin. And it's going to be a new commission with Leo as chair, with Naomi as the new commissioner, and of course, Jenny Potter. So my question to you is, Nicole, uh, if you had some some advice, some guidance for for Leo as chair in terms of what he should prioritize, what do you think he should prioritize uh, moving forward uh, it, it, during his uh, his chair uh, chairmanship of the Public Utilities Commission? What would you what would you offer to him? Um, I mean, I think the thing that the um, Public Utilities Commission should be prioritizing is ratepayers and consumers. And, you know, that should always be at the forefront of what is in what's in their best interest in terms of, uh, well, at least re regarding energy, you know, reliability and affordability and all of those things. And um, I think the commission functions best when it's not political and when it's really being driven by technical expertise and um, kind of a impartial weighing of the of the facts um, that can still you know it's impossible for things not to sort of it, you know different people have different views of the world and that that weighs into it as well but i think just remembering the um the rate pairs at the end of the day who, who, who have to pay these electric bills i think that is um that is what the puc is there for right to regulate a monopoly that otherwise would, could not be trusted to act in the best interests of the people of Hawaii. So it's the people of Hawaii that should be put first. Well, which to the, in my opinion, to the credit of the Public Utilities Commission under Jay Griffin with the performance-based uh, regulation being one of the very first in the country. In fact, there was a great piece in um, Utility Dive last week <laughs> uh, looking at Hawaii's implementation, the first in the country, as deep as, we've, as, deep as, as has been done. Uh, so setting the, setting the standard in a sense for others to follow suit on the mainland. So I think PBR is really uh, important, and you know, uh, I think under Jay and Jenny and Leo, that uh, there was a uh, definitely a high priority on the value and the importance of what you just said. So I, I cannot not, cannot imagine that won't continue under under Leo, especially like I said with high energy prices. So yeah, we're actually going to have Leo on in a couple of weeks, so it'll be very interesting to, to hear get his take as well. Nicole, what would you leave with the public? Um, on on, e, on energy, environment, and um, where we are? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that Hawaii, both in terms of climate policy and energy policy, has been a real leader. And that push for that has come from the legislature. Um, and that hasn't been without challenges. Uh, but I think that that the end result of it has been, you know, that we're moving in the right direction. And we have, at least in terms, I mean, we are meeting our RPS goals and are on track to exceed them. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, the um, war in Europe is causing energy prices to go up, but we were seeing a trend in the opposite direction prior to that. And that just really, Hammers home the importance of not being, you know, reliant on uh, such a large percent of our energy being imported into the state. That we need to rely more on local resources. Okay, Marco, it's time for you you to thank Nicole. Thank Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for <laughs> having so much me. for for joining us. And the time always goes by so too darn quickly. And there's uh, still a number of things on my wish list to ask you, but uh, that's. Uh, a great reason to have you back on the show again soon, I hope. So please, please do thank you. Thank, thank you, Marco. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Part and, two, uh, one more uh, technical, specific questions and not not if you had a magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be surprised if it happens again, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.